You're listening to Females in Fantasy, a podcast elevating the voices of women authors of science fiction and fantasy who write about kick-ass heroines. I am your host, Brianna Da Silva, and this is season three, episode five. And today I have a kind of sad announcement to make. I am going to be ending the Females in Fantasy podcast very soon. Uh, the short story for why that is, is, well, I've basically come to the point where I've kind of said everything I have to say about the topic of, fe- of female characters and podcasting. It takes a lot of time and uh, I really need to to spend that time now on on other projects. Most importantly, I would say is my novel, which my own novel, I really want to finish that and publish that. That's a high priority for me now. But I will be giving kind of a more detailed explanation for why I'm ending the podcast and what comes next in uh, in the next episode and the next and final episode after this one, it'll be a, a grand finale, kind of a, a monologue where I'll, I will wrap up some of my final thoughts about female characters. This has been a really awesome experience. And I just want to say thank you for all of you for being a part of it, whether you've been listening since the beginning or since more recently. Thank you for listening and sharing and being a part of this project. Today, for the very last interview of the podcast, we will be hearing from Catherine Hudson on the topic of dark female characters. We'll be talking all about anti-heroines, morally gray protagonists, and what our preference for or against dark characters really says about us. All right, without further ado, for the very last interview of Females in Fantasy, here's my conversation with Catherine. Welcome, Catherine, to the Females in Fantasy podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Brianna. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Like I said a few minutes ago, I'm just a little bit cold, <laughs> but uh, it's getting warmer, so that's nice. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, kind of give us the background on how you first got into writing and uh, you know what your journey was up until this moment. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, I write um, dark fantasy and sci-fi and sp- speculative thrillers, kind of sci-fi uh, bend in there. And I've been writing since I was 10. So I, I woke up one day and realized that uh, I, <laughs> I'd been having this reoccurring nightmare about uh, my favorite movie and that I couldn't change the ending of it. And I was really <laughs> just like devastated by it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I realized that I could rewrite the ending if I wanted to, to my favorite movie. And I didn't actually do that, but I started writing. And then it just kind of just kind of exploded from there. And I've been doing it. I've been writing rather large stories since I was 10. And let's see, I finished uh, my first two books when I was in high school. Um, that's currently the my Gionotis Children Dark Fantasy uh, duology, Daughter of the Dragon, Mother of the Dragon. And um, they were gigantic, <laughs> and I sat on them for years and years and years um, before I finally felt like they were ready to. Actually, I, I queried traditional publishing agents first, and that was the goal. I'd also I went to um, University of Colorado at Boulder for um, a bachelor's in creative writing fiction. So that was always like, you know, since I started writing, that was always the dream to go on and continue with that and um I I wanted to keep going and get my PhD in creative writing fiction but life did not work out that way I Mm. actually think I maybe prefer the way it's worked out now so um, that's good yeah that is good Uh, I didn't know if it would ever get there for a while but yeah so I started um querying traditional agents and I I racked up 116 rejection letters from these traditional agents for Daughter of the Dragon, which was my first book. And then, you know, after that, I was like, well, I, I have exhausted my traditional publishing options for now. And uh, I'll just I'll just do it myself. I'll take a look at indie publishing and I'll um, flop and fail my way through the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went for it. That's how it goes. Yeah, right? it is. It really is. And uh, I, I didn't even know who to ask for advice in the beginning. So it was a lot of trial and error for quite some time. But a year after, it was actually not even a year after I released um, Daughter of the Dragon through Exquisite Darkness Press, which is my um, indie publishing imprint. 
that book became an Amazon bestseller, Dark Fantasy. And so I was like, Ooh, awesome. hey, this is, this is something cool. And I think indie publishing is for me. So I have been doing it ever since. And I released my sixth book last November, which was ironically the only other manuscript I queried to traditional agents. And it was rejected by all of them. And it, it is my other bestseller. So sensing <laughs> a theme here, maybe. I don't know. But moral of the story is you're not a you're not a failure if you're rejected by traditional publishing. Absolutely. <laughs> not by any no stretch. No matter how many rejections you get, <laughs> you yes. definitely still have good good work to offer. People will read it, people will love it. Um, even if agents don't pick it up, which is a great moral to have of any story in this. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's really awesome because um, traditional publishing is one of the things that I'm really interested in. I don't have, I don't feel like I've had that many people. I have had a good number of hybrid authors on the podcast, but not that many that have like really like done primarily independent publishing. So I'm like, yes, yeah, another one of my people. <laughs> I mean, I'm not really, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't published my fantasy book yet, but that's what I'm planning to do. So. Excellent. Yay. Yay. So one of the things I want to talk with you about um, is anti-heroines or female anti-heroes, however you want to put it. <laughs> Basically, dark female characters, right? And there's a kind of a thing where it's like, okay, so personally, I love dark female characters. That's like my, pretty much my favorite type of character. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that says about me, because like deep down, I just have like a cold, dark just heart or something. Like that. But... <laughs> Those are the ones I feel most represented by. I don't know. Um, but uh, but sometimes it seems like some people have kind of like a hang up a little bit with like writing, like casting an anti-hero as female. Do you see that as being a thing? And and if you do, why do you think that might be? Why people get kind of like shy. Like they might be more hesitant. Yeah. Or do you even think they are? I don't know. It's your opinion. <laughs> Honestly, I, uh, I, I never have paid much attention to writing to market. Right. So I will, Mm. I write what I love and it just so happens to be those same, like totally dark, intense, brutal female characters who drive the story in all the best and worst ways. (laughs) And that's, that's what I love. (laughs) And with daughter of the dragon and mother of the dragon, the main character Keelan is definitely one of these uh, female characters. And um, I have, actually gotten nothing but amazing feedback about those books and her character specifically and everyone's just like ah this girl is so badass and you know people fall in love with her while also I have heard a lot of people say like I was so frustrated with this character and she drove me nuts but I couldn't stop and then you know of course it resolves itself that's what I love I love being able to take readers through this like totally spiking roller coaster I'm like I hate you I love you I hate you and what are you doing um which is very fun so I wonder you know if if there is a, a hesitation around reading those kinds of characters um you know it does have writing any kind of dark fiction uh, that really dives in there has of course um a potential to bring that stuff up in other people you know so um boom. Maybe one of the same reasons why I don't read romance, because I just, I don't need to be putting myself in a romance headspace. Not that, I mean, maybe that's not exactly what I'm saying, but I'm not, I'm not looking for that kind of, uh, I don't know, or even like really fantasy maybe, or yeah, where like, or, or happy endings aren't really my thing either. So <laughs> um, <laughs> now we get, now it gets real. Yeah. So I, I imagine that people who are uh, hesitant or resistant to reading these kinds of characters, um, and especially with female antiheroines, that it can bring up sort of this, like, bringing up that darkness to other people, that they mm-hmm. might not be in the headspace they want to be in to examine, or even experience through a character. I, I can't watch uh, movies with, like, super bloody, gory you know, like visceral scenes in it because it makes me queasy. I pass out when I see blood, but I can write about it all day long and <laughs> it doesn't bother me. And so I wonder if people are, you know, see themselves in, in that same way um, with reading these kind of characters that are 
I don't know. There's a little bit of that darkness in everybody, no matter how sweet a person is, you know, and uh, some people may not just be willing to explore that or recognize it in themselves. But I I haven't heard anything from my readers in reviews or emails or anything that was like, no, way too much for me. Maybe one of my grandmas. (laughs) That was not a surprise. That can be understandable. That can be understandable. Um, I made the mistake of recommending my my grandma um, really loves to read books. And I I recommended one of my favorite series to her, which is Red Rising. And she basically came back to me. She's like, that's too violent. I was like, oh. (laughs) Sorry. For me, it was perfect. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you, you're you familiar with the concept of the shadow, the kind of union absolutely, theory or whatever. Absolutely. Do you think that plays into why people are sometimes, well, on both, so this is like a two-faceted question, I suppose. Um, or maybe I'll just ask them one at a time. <laughs> so well, let's ask the first question. Um, do you think that plays into why some people are hesitant to go to those kind of dark places? It, it kind of has to do with like, you know, like we all have, the tendency in us, you know, to, to do dark and evil things. And that's something that we really, to be healthy, should examine and be aware of, right? Because it could catch you off guard if you don't recognize your own, like, potential to do terrible things. What if you get, you know, what if you, you're in a place of very deep bitterness or resentment and you can be tempted <laughs> to have revenge fantasy? You know, like, it's like, it's much better to be aware of, of what you're capable of. And then you're actually, like, much more powerful over it, right? Um, but do you think, do you think that ever plays into like why people don't want to read that kind of stuff? Cause they like unconsciously that part of them doesn't want to examine their own darkness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. It's scary. Like I, you know, it's hard work and, it, um, it can take you through a lot more of those dark places before being able to come out of it from, um, on the other side. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and that is, you know, probably the the driving force behind why I write such dark fiction is because I I want to illuminate the potential for people to see that going down these dark paths and examining them and exploring them and feeling all that despair and loss and pain and hopelessness and rage and everything that comes up um there's no light without darkness right um Mm -hmm. there's there's nothing to light up or improve or um bring hope into without having the opposite you know just that these these opposite spaces experiences can't exist without each other um and so i (laughs) i don't write happy endings but i do always leave some kind of hope there which is you know take it if you want it or don't But yeah, I, I do think that that definitely has something to do with um, why people may shy away from reading this kind of fiction because it is, you know, it, it, going into those dark places for one is incredibly personal, right? Like nobody wants to talk about that stuff. Um, and then when they see that reflected in one way or another by what they're reading, it it's one of those like, oh no, I don't need to, I don't need to do that. It can be triggering, I imagine. Um, in a lot of ways, I absolutely love it. <laughs> I have no, no problems with it at all. Um, cause I also just find it mm. so much fun, but yeah, yeah. I, I imagine that, um, it would be scary and, and probably, you know, I know a lot of people, I, myself included, pick up books to read, to like escape from <laughs> life or, you know, to, Oh yeah. So it's like reminding you of your own, like, right. Stuff right. That you haven't dealt with. Right. Which, mm. yeah, I, I think that's probably maybe um an experience for a lot of people definitely yeah you know it's interesting because i feel like a lot of writers are more comfortable going to those dark places um i don't know what that is maybe it just has to do with being a writer being that kind of a storyteller and a creative kind of makes you by nature a little bit more introspective i don't know that's just my theory but (laughs) i know (laughs) one of my brothers i don't know if he's gonna listen to this or not but he once made a comment about how like he was like bothered by writers because we, we we always joke about how like oh we're gonna torture our characters and we like laugh about it you know and um and he's like y'all are just like you just want to be sadist but then you won't do it in real life so you just like do it in your characters i'm like no it's not ex- i mean yes yeah. but no. <laughs> it's like well, yeah. yes but no it's like it's it's like i think some people maybe don't really understand it's actually in my opinion 
kind of a healthier place to be psychologically because it's like you're actually confronting kind of those dark things um, versus like leaving them in the shadow as you would talk about. Hey, what do you think it is? On, so the second, the second question <laughs> I was going to ask, kind of the opposite. What is it that does draw people? Because some people, I think, prefer reading about darker characters versus reading about, you know, like the heroic noble ones. Right? Some people find like, you know, that like Harry Potter's and, and Luke Skywalker's to be kind of annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Almost like, cause they're like too like noble or something like too perfect. But then if they read about, you know, someone like Han Solo or someone that's like a little bit more of an anti-hero, someone that's a little bit more darker and they make more mistakes and stuff. It's like, maybe it's a little bit less, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I'll, I'll say yeah, my no, opinion after you. Sure. I think, um, so there are, are two possibilities that come to mind when I think about this. And the first is, basically the exact opposite of my last answer is that people people (laughs) see themselves in those characters right and and imperfect characters who are Mm. critically flawed and still want something so passionately which is the best cornerstone for any good piece of writing is is any character with their desires right and what they have to do to, to achieve them those types of characters are in my opinion they feel so much realer to the reader right so and then when people are are reading about these flawed characters who act human and say human things and make mistakes um it is a a way for them to connect deeper with the story and to really put themselves into it that's one of the things i love when i read just like (laughs) even when i read something that makes me cry which is like it's got to be really good (laughs) to make me feel that kind of emotion that's when like oh wow this is this is good stuff this really hit me and then and it illuminates this quality of craft on the author's part for being able to affect readers so intensely with with something they created and then also you know watching darker characters like that working their way through the storyline and their own character arcs and growing and becoming something more and better hopefully than they had been in the beginning is um i think it's awfully cathartic you know um for Mm, for readers who are connecting and identifying with these characters so you're watching someone who makes you think of yourself or has similarities to you go through this process of of becoming something that is much better for them and maybe potentially everyone else around them and there's some of that like following their journey with them and experiencing that for yourself as a reader so that is that's one of the reasons why i love it so much um and also the the other part of of what occurred to me is that it it may just be you know when you see characters who are so messed up and have so many problems going on and have to go through so many hard things it's like oh hey well at least my life isn't that crappy (laughs) like you know that may be that may be a reason as well but I, I'm definitely one of those people who enjoy following those characters on their process and then also um, putting them through it myself as an author. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like, I, I feel like if, if more of us are honest, we kind of all are anti-heroes. Mm-hmm. You know, like when we're really like people that are really uh, like aware of themselves would, I think, see that. It's like, so when you have like a hero hero, like your standard hero they usually are kind of more of an ideal. I think that they're like the kind of person that we prop up when we kind of want to be, but then an anti-hero feels a little bit more like who we are. And so then when they accomplish their goals, you know, it makes it, it makes it that much more like relatable, I think for a lot of people, because they're like, Oh, okay, now I can do that too. Because if they manage to do it, I mean, (laughs) yeah, especially if they're like darker than you are, it's like this person managed to make the right decision. Okay. So I can. (laughs) There's hope for me still. Definitely. Yeah. 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 What do you think about, and I don't know if you, if you have an opinion on this, but, you know, I'm going to put it out there, <laughs> um, the, the kind of the conversation that's going on around likability and how, like, that it's something that supposedly comes up more with female characters, like if they're more of an antihero or something that, like, people are like, oh, I just don't like her. And some people will say that that's, like, some sort of sexist, sexism going on. I'm personally not really sure. I don't really, like, see it that much, but I don't know. What do you think about it? This, uh, you know, this is the first time that I've actually thought about it, even, like, or heard about it. Um, we, you, <laughs> no, you know, worries, there's, no worries. No, though. it's it's great. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't like something about something, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's mm-hmm. just unavoidable. And um, I actually, you know, hey, people who don't like this can 
just not like it. That's fine. And you're right. not going like to like anything else I do. So <laughs> I'm not going to, I don't feel the need to try and please everyone. And I think that's impossible, mm-hmm. you know, um, in life mm-hmm. and in fiction, like you're just not going to do it. I don't know. I think there's a lot of, not even just in female characters too. I am, um, I, I spoke with another author who was um, talking about one of his, oh, one of his series that he got awful, horrible reviews for, in his opinion, because of the fact that he made his main character was a man a little too believable or too human. Um, And he was Hmm. thinking that his readers wanted to see, I mean, so this is um, lit RPG. (laughs) man wrote and so it's a completely different genre and you know that is where like the manly hero comes into play um i guess and uh i think that this author was thinking that his male audience didn't want to be diving into the uh a male main character who couldn't make up his mind or made awful decisions and got into trouble or you know that and and he was mm. saying you know this feels to me like also like kind of a misogynist viewpoint or around Sandra's or I I maybe I don't know <laughs> it's okay <laughs> that that his his male audience didn't want to be reading about themselves maybe mm-hmm. <laughs> um mm-hmm. and so I wonder you know like if with female characters and and whether or not these readers saying I just don't like her so I'm not going to do it are female or women or men you know there's that potential in some respects for you know women readers to be saying I you know I don't want to see myself in a female main character who is not somebody who I want to be or you know everybody wants people to like them right I mean unless you're just one of those people (laughs) who just don't care and then like I envy you I think (laughs) but (laughs) <laughs> um but yeah I th- probably for the same reason the whole darkness you know people who don't li- I mean th- there's a big difference between a poorly written main character um yeah who is unlikable because they're unrealistic and a very well written fleshed out rounded character who isn't super nice or sweet or pretty or whatever you know um and yeah that is an interesting question I have never actually I don't think I've actually read anything where I was like oh I just really don't like this character like I just can't get past it and then you know there's always that suspension of disbelief but um yeah that is interesting do you do you have any thoughts on that I'm interested to hear um, I'm I'm kind of undecided about the topic. It's something that's actually come up a number of times with other people that have come on my podcast. And I've, as I thought about it, I'm like, I'm not so sure. I feel like it's kind of overemphasized or, or um, it'll happen in like real life too. Where people talk about like, oh, I just don't like this female politician or actress or something. And, and people are like, oh, they're being sexist. And I'm just like, maybe they just don't like them. Yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> can people just like and dislike people? Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know whether or not that happens disproportionately with women. And personally, if it does, I guess I just don't care. Maybe I'm just one of those people that just don't really yeah. care about things like that. Um, it's like, if someone doesn't like me, I'm kind of like, what, what person you mentioned earlier, if someone doesn't like me, I like don't even care. So, but there is a thing where it's like, you want to have your characters be likable. I don't know if it's necessarily the same kind of concept that I'm talking about. Like you want people to be able to read for them basically. Um, and so if, if a lot of people can't connect with your character enough to root for them then maybe that is a problem with the character and and it could be it could be that some people struggle more to do that with female characters or maybe it's just maybe it's not really a problem I don't know I'm kind of unsure um but I do suspect that people that are bringing this up might be overemphasizing this <laughs> I don't yeah, know, the, necessarily think it's always sexism right. it's like and everything is sexism you know it can always be something else going right. on. right and that's yeah that has you know, not to downplay anything that is happening currently, you know, and, and the dialogue yeah. that's, that's going out, <laughs> going around about really every single topic. But I, I agree. I think in some ways, like people are really looking for <laughs> that, like compartmentalization of <laughs> you said this Probably and it too. means this. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah, kind of like, we should just, <laughs> we should just all chill, man. Like, 
<laughs> I'm gonna keep writing. Exactly. Why don't you pick up a book and then, like, you know, let it let it go. But yeah, I I feel like I'm right there with you on the page of like, meh. I don't really care. Yeah. yeah some people get a little excited and I I don't get involved. <laughs> I guess my point, too, is that even if it is sexism, it's like, well, I think if you're going to fix that is just maybe keep writing characters like that and then people will get over it. Like, I, you know, it's just, I don't really feel like it's something to get really upset over personally. And I don't mean that in like I don't mean that to like insult people that are upset over it. Like, obviously, I'm not trying to like <laughs> say your emotions aren't valid. I'm just saying that it would, we don't have to be upset over it. Right. You know, right. It's okay. We can spin our energies in, in other things. Definitely. Um, like writing more stories. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So you have a lot of so you have assassins in one of your series, mm-hmm. um, which is really fun. That's like a it's like one of those things that's become not cliche, but like very. It's like one of those things that never gets old. Right? Oh yeah, that there's a lot of it, oh, yeah. which is a good thing. Yeah. very much. <laughs> are there any like tropes related to assassins that you are either tired of or you just want to see more of? Oh boy, <laughs> tropes of assassins. La 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 la. I got you off guard. You did. You one. did. Well done. <laughs> um, I think, you know, so I, I, and it's funny that I say this because I write, like everything I write has a romantic subplot, like a, just, just one tiny little string that just goes because it, why not? You know, I'm like, I don't know why I do that, but it helps. <laughs> um, I, I think probably because it, it creates so much tension, <laughs> not sexual tension or romantic tension but like my characters are being like what am I doing what the hell is happening right now um just another you know there's some heartbreak in there and it just keeps <laughs> <laughs> add some more pain yeah, why not here's yes. pain add some more pain. probably that's why I do it <laughs> to give them something and then take it away um but <laughs> and I haven't I didn't do this with um my main character and daughter of the dragon Keelan she, I mean I did do the romance part. I'm talking about I, I did not, at least I hope I didn't, uh, <laughs> use the assassin trope slash love interest that, you know, where it's, where it's, oh, I've been an assassin this whole time and I fell in love with someone and now I need to change my ways because I'm a horrible person and I'm going to give it all up for this love, right? That, nah. Um, I don't find that very appealing, um, or engaging. And so that would be, you know, one of the trips that I'm like, you know, come on, I, I, yeah. And another reason why I don't read romance, because I just, I don't like reading things where love and relationships drive the plot of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I would much rather see things like what I attempted to do, what I hope I succeeded in is is this um this independence of specifically female main character who would is an assassin of this yes i can do both right like i can be this brutal killing machine and just like destroy the entire world and come out on top and also i can be with this person whoever so happens whoever it happens to be and they're just gonna have to deal with what i do and suck it up (laughs) And <laughs> come with me if you want to or not. And I think maybe because that is how I I have always been in my relationships. <laughs> so one of those, like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. The truth comes out again. Yeah, right? Hey, that's why we're doing this. Right? That's, that's why we write. <laughs> there is truth in all of it. And my husband has been the only person who's been able to, like, keep up and also do the same thing, right? Be like, I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You can do what you're doing with me. Hey. Um, and not trying to change in fiction who these characters were before. Mm, uh, I like that. Yeah. And so, and I think that's really important, you know, like I think that's an important message across the board anyways, is that, you know, being in relationships with people is not, is something that is, let's say much better and much healthier when it's not changing who you are to be in it it's when it's developing and growing who you are with another person. And which is funny, though, because now that I think about it, like there, there, is, there are those tropes with assassin characters and where like if they're a woman, <laughs> there is that like, oh, you found this love and now you have to like not be an assassin. Right. Anymore. <laughs> you know, like and 
And then it's like, oh, I have to be, you know, this kind hearted person and fall in love and get swept off my feet by whoever. And then if it's a man assassin, it's one of those like, oh, I can't. I just can't let go of my cruelty in my past and how much I need to kill people. And, you know, like, I never thought about that. It just occurred it to me just thing. now. And, um, yeah. and uh, that's so funny um, that, yeah, that, that is a funny realization. But, you know, I, I got a lot of feedback and reviews and from readers sending me stuff, which is always so much fun to get. But they're like, my favorite thing about Keelan, main character in Daughter of the Dragon, is that she... Like, she doesn't need anybody to save her. She doesn't want anybody to save her. She destroys <laughs> and, like, is completely unapologetic about it and blames everyone else for her problems, which, you know, that's part of her character growth. But there are there is that romantic subplot, and she does actually sleep with three different men in the, in the duology, but, <laughs> but, well, right, hey, but none of them are saving her. Like, even, even the character Rokin who becomes well, her partner is there's literally nothing he can do to change her mind or stop her or get her to do anything that she doesn't want to do and mm-hmm. that was like a big like yay for this character that I got from readers which I think when I was writing it just came as a natural like why would she need like she's already badass when when the story starts <laughs> yeah. like how could it improve the story to <laughs> make her need somebody? I like that yeah um yeah no I'm just saying it's like I think that is a good message because sometimes people especially because probably even for people on the inverse like people that think that they can get into a relationship and change someone that can be a really toxic thing to believe and so it's better to have examples of like relationships where we realize that like uh, you know a healthy relationship is one in which yes you're going to the other person will bring out the best in you but it's not like you have to change who you are to be with them because that's not gonna no. last you're still who you are right. it's like eventually your real person is gonna just come out again and then you know that's you have to deal part. with it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> better to be true to yourself um there's always more more fish in the in the, in the ocean or however it goes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure well time always goes by so quickly on this podcast yeah. um thank you so much for being on the show yeah thank you for having me this is great fun <laughs> i love the conversation thanks <laughs> yes yes before we go, just real quickly, let people know how they can keep up with you, find your work, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. My website first, it's katherinehudsonfiction.com, and that's spelled K-A-T-H-R-I-N. If you put an E in there, it's totally wrong. Um, probably will still find me, but I just have to say it. <laughs> all, all my books are available there on my website. Uh, they are also across the board everywhere. Amazon, Kobo, Barnes Noble, Apple iBooks, or Apple Books, blah, blah everywhere there i'm on facebook at uh katherine hudson fiction and instagram at katherine hudson fiction and twitter is actually klh create works i haven't changed that yet but yeah i am all over the place you'll be able to find me there <laughs> awesome awesome we well, have a good thanks, one thanks you too that was my conversation with katherine big shout out to my top two patrons Brandon, the world deity of the Females in Fantasy podcast, all hail, and Fred C. Moulton, the fantastic galactic wizard. Last time on the show, I will be having a grand finale episode, and I won't say much about it yet, except that I plan to make it a treat, so you won't want to miss it. This has been the Females in Fantasy podcast. I am Brianna Da Silva. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 